just remind you what we had done and so with what I will continue. I had introduced, so we are looking at functions in L2 of R typically. And uh, I had introduced operators acting on these functions that shift them around by this, that modulate them And then I also had introduced a convenient phase factor on top of that. It's a convenient phase factor because um, what we had seen was that if we took the product of two such operators, it expressed itself beautifully in terms of the operator that had the sum of shifts and the sum of the two modulating exponentials and then a phase factor that, because we had introduced this one, had a very nice uh, symmetric form. Um, something that I did not emphasize, uh, well, or maybe I did. This is obviously a unitary operator. Um, it's uh, because of, of if, if we look at, at its shape and we look at what we get when we multiply it with the operator of negative the argument, then we get obviously a zero shift and a zero uh, frequency modulation, so that's the identity operator. And the phase factor, well, we get T1 times nu2 and then minus T2 and new one, which vanishes, and so we have that the phase factor is one. So we have that it's a unitary operator of which the inverse is its adjoint, since it's unitary, and we see here that its inverse is thus, so we already see immediately that the adjoint of each of these is the thing with the inverse arguments. We had also seen that uh, if we took an integral over all of R2 of the inner products of an arbitrary function with a window function that is translated and modulated, and we used, we integrated with respect to a different window function. And 1 over 2 pi. That, and I understand this integral in the weak sense. That's to say, I take its inner product with g in order to give it a, a good definition. Then what we get here is the inner product of these two windows times the function f. And so if I take an inner product of the left side with g, I get the inner product of f with g. Uh, in particular, if uh, the two windows are the same, which is the case that, 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 that interests us the most, and if the window is normalized in L2, then we get the identity operator. And so because that is something we'll use quite a bit let me write it specially. So in that case, I have um, I like to interpret what I'm doing as taking, I mean, typically I take windows that are very well localized in time around zero and of which the Fourier transform because the window itself is smooth, the Fourier transform is going to be well localized as well, around zero again. And so I like to think of, of 
projecting on, 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 on such a W as something that localizes the content of my original function around zero in time and frequency. If I move it around with these translation modulation operators, then I'm thinking in time frequency space of looking at around the T nu point and localizing around there. So these are all one rank one projection operators that localize around different pieces in time frequency space. And the sum of all these gives me the identity operator. So it's sometimes called uh, a resolution of the identity. Identity. OK. And then finally, uh, something that we had also seen is I was interested, and I will continue to be interested, in the case where I discretize, oops, oh shoot. I will be interested in the case where I don't look at t and nu as continuously changing parameters, but I will be interested in the case where I look at m tau and omega uh, window. And uh, in that case, I will be interested in a function, uh, an operator that uh, uh, goes from L2 of R to typically, and we'll see, I'll have to come back to that, square, to square summable sequences, which maps F to uh, F with these shifted and And one thing that we had seen last week was that if tau times omega is 2 pi, and if uh, w decays, so the window decays faster than 1 plus s, 1 plus epsilon, and its Fourier transform as well, then uh, it was impossible uh, to get, uh, th then uh, we could not form an orthonormal basis. Um, well, actually, what I claimed is what if you had that, then no family W, uh, M, N, where I call this W M N can form an orthonormal basis. Regardless of the choices for tau and omega. What I showed you was that this could not be done if the product tau omega was 2 pi. We'll actually come back to the fact that omega times tau has to be 2 pi for a basis today. But so that's what we've done. And uh, as a tool in that proof, what I had also introduced was a, uh, a, a, a transform from L2 of R to L2 of the square, which I called the Zach transform and which was defined by this sum. And it's well defined for f that are sufficient, that have sufficient decay. But what we showed is that on such function, it had, uh, uh, it was a, a norm-preserving operator. And so we could extend it to all of L2 by unitarity. And we proved that an orthonormal basis was mapped to an orthonormal basis. And so we were, we were done. OK, so. <coughs> Today, I will embroider further on some of these. Um, I will also, at some point, either today or next week, I mean, many of these things that I'm doing here have a complete analog in the wavelet world. 
I mean, I'm talking here about windowed Fourier transforms, and I will mention those too, but actually we'll stay mostly with the windowed Fourier world in, in these presentations. Okay, so, um, and I promised you we would come back to this uh, uh, localization operator. Part of what we will do today is we'll be interested in looking at the operator. So I'll be interested in still looking at these uh, superpositions of uh, uh, T. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. T and integrate over 2 pi. Uh, if I integrate it over all of R, I get a, R2, I get F. What I will be doing here is I'll integrate over a, a, a subset. I'll integrate over the, the T and nu within a disk. And I also will, because it is convenient, work with a very special window function, which is a Gaussian. And this, I def this defines to me a localization operator on the disk with radius r on f. So I define an operator lr this way. It's my perfect right, as I had a, a, a professor uh, who on, on oral exams, if, you, if students wrote something particularly obtuse on the board, so on, he says, well, that's your perfect right to write this. But then you had to explain, so I'll, I'll be explaining. So, um, okay, G here, uh, so I'll use, because it turns out to be a very nice thing to use for me, the uh, Gaussian normalized this way, so you can check for yourself that this has L2 norm 1. Um, it is for uh, uh, in, in for physicists uh, uh, among us to the, the 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 ground state of the harmonic oscillator. Uh, it has a, a, a number of very beautiful properties with respect to this uh, uh, transform. Let's look at that. W T nu G. So I get this normalization, I have f of s, and then let's write out what, what this whole thing is. I get exponential of minus a half, and I get, I have a g, uh, a g of s minus t, so let me write out minus a half s squared, minus a half t squared, and then plus s t. Then I have, uh, this is conjugated, so I get a minus i nu s and then plus i over 2 nu t and this whole thing s. So I can, let me rewrite that in a fancy way. So I have an e to the minus a half s squared. Okay, I keep that. Then I have uh, e to the s t minus i nu. And then I like to uh, incorporate this as a double product as well. So let's, if I write e to the minus a quarter t minus i nu squared, then you see that the double product will give me exactly that. I will already have one quarter of the t squared I had here, so I need to write another quarter. And I have here added, because of the i squared, nu squared over 4, so I have to subtract it. And this might be a completely silly thing to do. Uh, what I wanted to do, except that it, it gives me something useful. It gives me something that, apart from this factor e to the minus one quarter of what's really the magnitude of t nu squared, 
it gives me a function that is analytic in uh, t minus i nu, or if you wish, in uh, minus i nu plus i t, so in nu plus i t. Sorry, what means t nu bracket? Oh, uh, so t nu, I'm viewing that now as an element in R2. And uh, I write its magnitude squared as the Glidian norm t squared plus nu squared. Right, right. From the physics point of view, it's slightly strange to have t and nu of different dimensions to be added. So there is a Absolutely. unit of frequency. I have a unit of frequency put to zero. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm thinking of the harmonic oscillator, and I've put the frequency equal to 1. And that's where that comes from. This unit has disappeared on me. I agree. Um, OK. So, uh, and in fact, what happens is that uh, the transform, so I'm one for functions in, uh, uh, in L2 to functions that are analytic. And of course, if you're an analytic function, then you grow in certain directions. But they don't grow badly enough that when you multiply them with this factor, they become square integrable again. So they're functions, analytic functions that have uh, growth that is controlled sufficiently so that uh, this, this multiplier turns them into square integrable functions. And that's called the Bargman-Hilbert space. So, so it maps fun to function in the Bargman-Hilbert space. I mean, which is a very nice and beautiful tool to work with. We'll implicitly be doing some computations in there, but I will not uh, typically write them out in, in detail in the Bargman space. But so, um, OK, so that's the Gaussians. Um, I'll, I'll before, I mean, so my goal is to get to tell you things about that localization operator that will be very useful and, and interesting. But to get there, I'm going to introduce yet other things which also will be interesting and useful. OK. Uh, so now I'm looking at this phase space with time and frequency. And so uh, I look at points with coordinates t nu because I have implicitly introduced a frequency that I put equal to 1. So in, in, fan, in sense, I'm, I'm using the fact that you can do dimensional uh, 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 analysis in physics in order to find what dimensions things should have to sweep, to, to get rid of all, the, all, 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 all units, I mean, which is a, a di an abuse, if, if, you, uh, if, if you wish, but it makes my life easy. Um, and I'm going to be interested in rotating things in time frequency space. So a rotation over angle theta. So I'll define r theta of t nu to be cosine theta t um, plus sine theta nu minus sine theta t uh, plus cosine theta nu. Or, I mean, if you, you think of it in terms of a column vector, then you have the standard matrix acting on t nu. And it rotates the way you indicate, or the other way? I mean, really. Uh, do I? Um, no, no, just to. I'm always confused. I'm always confused too. So, what do I do? If theta is positive, then. Uh, so, if I'm here, then I become negative. So, I think it's correct. 
Okay, um, so let me define an operator u theta by saying, look, if I had, I integrate in, again over the full plane, u theta on f is defined by taking the inner products of f with the Gaussian. And then here I write w of r theta t nu on the Gaussian. And I integrate over the t d nu over 2 pi. And uh, that's a linear, uh, clearly a very linear operator. If theta is zero, we know that already that that's the identity operator. And uh, I, what I will, what we'll see is that this operator has a very natural way of acting on uh, so what I claim is that u theta on a w t prime nu prime g will be easy to compute. It will have a very nice expression. In fact, I claim, so for the moment this is a claim, that this is going to be just r theta t prime nu prime on g. So let's verify that. And we don't really need to do a lot for that. It's clear that we will have to, I mean, we'll have to insert this thing in there. So it is a good idea to have a nice expression for what a w t1 nu1 g with a w t2 nu2 g is. Well, we know the adjoint is minus the operator. We know what happens when we, uh, when we take the product of two of them. We get a phase factor, and I have it here, the second member, so I have to take it. Uh, uh, I have to take its conjugate, and that will give me an e to the i over 2 t1 nu2 minus t2 nu1. Is that correct? Let's be careful. G e to the i over 2. Uh, to sign that flips. Yeah, that's what I thought too, but I wasn't. Uh, uh, so negative t1 nu 2 and then plus t2 nu 1 and w minus t1 plus t2 minus nu 1 plus nu 2 g. And so I get e to the i over 2 t1 nu 2 minus t2 nu 1. And then in a product of g with w of OK. Um, So we need to look at things like that. So let's look here. We had a computation that already had given us in detail a general f with a whole Gaussian like that. So let's just write g w t nu g here. I get another pi minus a quarter. It gives me pi minus a half. And then I get an exponential minus a half s squared and then all that other stuff. So I get exponential 
minus s squared minus a half d squared plus s d minus i nu s plus i over 2 nu t. And this thing, the s. Okay. This I can rewrite as minus s minus t over 2 squared. That accounts for this and the double product. Then I have taken a minus t squared over 4. No? Ah, sorry. Minus a quarter t squared. Then I have here minus i nu s minus t over 2. And that's it. Okay. And then what I have is, and you can work out that all the square roots of 2 and pi and so on work out. What I have essentially is a Fourier transform of the Gaussian. But uh, normally if I had a over 2 here, then it would give me, uh, the Fourier transform would give me minus nu squared over 2. Because I don't have that factor, I get a nu squared over 4. And I get exponential minus t squared over 2 minus nu squared over 4 minus nu squared over 4. So, if I plug that in here, then I get e to the i over 2 t1 nu 2 minus t2 nu 1. And then here I have, with notation that I introduced over there, the exponential of minus a quarter and then the Euclidean norm of t2 minus t1 nu2 minus nu1. And now that I'm introducing Euclidean uh, norms and so on, I'm going to rewrite this in a similar way. It is, after all, the inner product of t1 nu1 with nu2 minus t2, or uh, if I, if I uh, introduce matrix J, which is uh, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, which has the property that if I let it act on the vector t nu maps me in, in nu negative t, then I can rewrite this whole thing as exponential of i over 2 t1 nu 1 dot j of t2 nu 2 and minus a quarter the Euclidean norm of their difference. Okay. So I'm going to use all that in order to look at what this left-hand side is. By my definition, this is 1 over 2 pi integral over the whole plane of what? I take the inner product of w t prime nu prime g with w t nu g. And then I have here w r theta t nu g and I integrate. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change integration variable. I can call this my integration variable and then put, because the, uh, this measure is invariant under rotation in time frequency plane, I can go back. So this becomes
and here I have W of rotation over minus the angle. And here I have just Okay, here I'm going to use the computation that I worked out there. So this becomes 1 over 2 pi r2. And then, okay, I have here exponential of i over 2 t prime nu prime dot dot what dot j and then what I had as argument here so r minus theta t nu okay and then the next thing I have is minus a quarter of the difference between these things. So t prime nu prime minus r minus theta t nu and the Euclidean norm of that thing. And that's this whole inner product. And I have here w t nu g dt t nu. Okay, now here, because the Euclidean norm is invariant on the rotation, I can put the rotation there. Now, if you look at J, J in fact is nothing but one of these rotations itself. J is R pi over 2. I mean, if you plug in pi over 2 in our definition of R, R theta, then you get exactly j. And all these rotations, of course, commute. I mean, they're rotations in the plane. So this is here the same as t prime nu prime dot r minus theta acting on j t nu. And because the dot product is invariant under rotation, that's the same thing as putting the rotation here and taking the dot product with that. And then I, now I have, you see, with these operations I've put r theta always on t prime nu prime. And now I can backtrack in the whole thing and I'll see that this is 1 over 2 pi, the integral over r2 of w of r theta t prime nu prime on g, inner product with w t nu g, w t nu g dt d nu. And so since that gives me the identity operator, it's just as I claimed in the beginning, r uh, theta t prime nu prime on g. And so my claim is established. Okay, so I have rotations in time frequency space. Now you might say time rotation time frequency space, what does that really mean? Well, something that maps time in negative frequency and frequency to time is really the same thing as the Fourier transform. If you take a W T nu G, the Fourier transform, you will find that that is uh, in Xi. Well, yeah, this is the same thing as, uh, well, on any F actually. This is the same thing as acting with nu and negative t on the Fourier transform. So if I look at this in Xi and I look at this in Xi, I get exactly the same thing. So the Fourier transform is a rotation in time frequency space. These 
rotations over angles that are not quite uh, uh, 90 degrees are the same as what's known as fractional uh, uh, Fourier transform. I always find it very complicated in papers in fractional Fourier transform to read at everything they're doing. But if I think simply about it as rotating in time frequency space, it becomes much easier. Now, there are some operators that behave in a very, th some functions that have a very simple behavior under these uh, uh, rotations. So we have seen here that if you take the Gaussian itself and you move it and translate it around, all you do with it is just rotate its l label. I mean, that's all you do when you apply these, these rotations. So it's very natural. Um, something similar happens to when you involve not just Gaussians, but Hermite functions. So, so the action of these u theta on Hermite functions. Okay. So I define my Hermite functions. The zeroth order Hermite function is just my Gaussian. And then I define the H ends as up to normalization, so a normalization factor to keep it times. So multiplying some operator that I uh, apply uh, n times on the Gaussian. So for instance, if I take the, 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 the negative derivative on the Gaussian, I get a factor x. This also gives me a factor x, so I get x times the Gaussian, and I have to normalize things so to get them normalized. But that's essentially what the Hermite functions are. By the way, can, can one see u theta as uh, exponential theta of the Hamiltonian of the harmonic? Yes, theta? absolutely. And that's why everything that's going to come out now comes out so nicely. Absolutely. And, and that's how, in fact, I found what I, everything what I'm going to say here first. But, but people in, in math uh, these days are not as uh, familiar with the harmonic oscillator anymore. Well, maybe in France they are, but in the States they're not. <laughs> so, okay. So, and of course that's the creation operator um, of the harmonic oscillator. So these are the Hamid functions. Um, so that already tells me something very nice about what if I take these modulated and shifted Gaussians and I take their inner product with the H nth. So if I take the Bargman transform of the H nth, that gives me something very nice already. Um, why? Well, <coughs> it's the integral h n s uh, of uh, exponential minus a half s minus t squared, then uh, minus i nu s plus i over 2 nu t ds. And so I have here, up to normalization, this s minus d ds to the nth power applied to g. If I 
use integration by parts for all the derivatives. Every minus dds becomes a plus. At infinity, everything gives zero contribution, so I have no boundary terms. So up to normalization, I will find that this is going to be the integral of gs. And now I have to apply s plus dds on this thing. on this exponential. But let's see what that gives. DDS on this thing is going to give me minus s minus t minus i nu. And then I have to add an s. And so that whole thing gives me t minus i nu. And so what I get here is up to normalization, I will get t to the minus i nu. I have to do this n times. And then what I get here is just the well, the Bartman image of the Gaussian self, and we know exactly what that is. That's exponential minus a quarter t squared plus nu squared. So if you think in the Bartman space, this factor e to the minus a quarter t squared plus nu squared is always there. You always have in front of it some analytic function of not too fast uh, increase. And what you get here is just the monomials. So the Hermit functions become extraordinarily simple in Bartman space. There are also um, t to the minus i nu. OK, so we'll see that in a sec. OK, so let me get all my boards in order. Ah, I have this magic thing, this magic thing here. Ooh, can I still? Yes, I can still get that. OK. So I now, what I'd like to show is um, that ut, u theta acting on the hn is something really, really simple. OK, u theta acting on hn. Let's look at what we get when we compute, uh, well, let's, let's, let's not do it this way. Let's, oops, ah, here. It's by definition of Hn. And then I have, uh, well, I apply u theta wherever I defined it there. I will again put the r theta on, on the other side. So I get r minus theta w of this on t nu g. And here I get t nu g dt d nu over 2 pi, and I integrate over all of R2. Uh, here, let's write that out. This, the Euclidean norm of T nu is invariant under rotation, so I can just write exponential minus a quarter 
t squared plus nu squared. And now I have to write here, so I have the t part of, well, let, let, let me write out what this thing is. I mean, I have to write r, uh, so something that depends on t and nu. So r, the t part of r t nu t plus i part, the r theta of t nu theta, uh, minus, and distant to the nth. But as you can, as you, 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 you no doubt expect, this will become much simpler than that. Because t minus i nu is nothing but t nu dot 1 minus i. The point, the point with two coefficients, uh, with two components, one and minus i. So um, I have, if I have to look at, look at r theta uh, t nu dot one minus i, then that's the same thing as t nu dot r minus theta acting on 1 minus i. And let's look at what r theta gives on 1 minus i. It gives a vector of which the first component is cosine theta times 1 and then negative sine theta because I have negative theta times negative i so that's plus i sine theta. And the second component gives me negative sine theta which become positive sine theta because I had a negative theta times 1 plus, well, I have a minus i minus i cos theta, which is, I mean, we use the moivre, of course, e to the i theta 1 minus i. And so what has happened is that I have exactly e to the, min e to the i theta times t nu dot 1 minus i. So this whole thing is just the expression in which I can bring e to the i and theta and then I had the expression in as if there were no theta, no rotation in there. So this again, exponential sorry, this I can go back and so on and so what I find is that u theta of hn is just e to the i n theta hn. So it's the harmonic oscillator minus a half, what that is, that is u theta, exponential of theta times harmonic oscillator minus a half, minus the ground energy. Okay, so u theta is this beautiful unitary operator that acts very simply on these shifted and modulated Gaussians and that has the Hermite functions as eigenfunctions with very simple eigenvalues. And that is now going to help me to deal with the operator that I had at the very top there and uh, that I want to analyze further. Because, let's look at this operator LR. And imagine that you let LR work on a u theta f. So the f up there I have to replace by u theta. That of course, I mean, so now we're going to do some, some a little bit of mental uh, stuff. The u theta in front of that f I can, it's a unitary operator, I can just bring as an adjoint on the other side. So it gives me a u minus theta on the w's. So let me write that. u minus theta on wt nu g 
w t nu g. But we know what u theta gives on a w. This is just w of r minus theta on t nu. We let it act on the label. And then I use the fact that this disk in time frequency space is invariant under rotation to make a change of variable. I mean, so I change this. This becomes my integration variable. And then I have to write here an r theta t nu g. But that is exactly because of my computations, u theta acting on these. And of course, that's going to be the same. I mean, and if you need to be super uh, rigorous about it, Remember that we define these integrals via in weak form and write it in weak form and then, then work it through. This is going to be the same as u theta acting on LR. So this operator commutes. This is a very nice, so my picture is in time frequency space. And I'm defining disks of radius R. And uh, I localize, remember, every one of these projection one operators tries to localize as well as possible around T nu. And in fact, when you use as your window a Gaussian, you can give an explicit definition to localizing as best as possible. In, in, if you think of it in terms of quantum mechanics, then you know you can't localize ex ex extremely precisely in both time, position, and momentum. And you, what you do is you localize as well as possible and compatible with the uncertainty principle. So you localize exquisitely finely and you superpose many of these, but you only superpose the ones within this disk. So I'm cutting out from the whole function only the content that it has within this disk. And that, it turns out, computes, commutes with uh, rotation in time frequency space as, as it should. I mean, if my localization operator made many sense, it should do that. And in fact, we verify that it does. What that means is that since the Hermit functions are eigenfunctions of the u theta, and if theta is not rational, then it's not degenerate, uh, you find that uh, the eigenfunctions of the u theta have to be eigenfunctions of the LR. So you know that the LRs have to be eigenfunctions of these localization operators. And you can actually find the eigenvalues very simply because L lambda and R is going to be the integral of, uh, well, it's going to be the inner product of L R H N H N. And by the definition of my LR, this is going to be 1 over 2 pi, the integral over t squared plus nu squared less than r squared of hn with w t nu g squared dt d nu. And we know exactly what that is, because we did compute it somewhere else. And with a bit of luck, I may not have erased it yet. And uh, well, no, I'm, I don't have that luck. But we know that this was exactly, uh, uh, oh, I've run out of words. OK. So we knew that gave us the exponentials times the monomials. So let's put that in.
So it's giving us 1 over 2 pi integral t squared plus nu squared less than r squared. And then I'll have some normalization, which I haven't bothered to compute, but which of course one can compute exquisitely precisely. Yeah. Uh, and I get here, uh, and I get absolute value. So t plus i nu in absolute value is t squared plus nu squared to the n. And then e to the minus a quarter squared gives me e to the minus a half t squared plus nu squared. And dt d nu. And we can even do the integral over the angle. And what we, we find is the 2 pi miraculously drops out. And we get an incomplete gamma function. We get uh, n, n squared. And then we get from 0 to r, uh, r to the 2n, e to the minus a half r squared, 2n plus 1, the r. Uh, so we get, by renormalizing, uh, we get r squared over 2, uh, u to the n e to the minus u du. And uh, if you work out the full normalization, I mean, we now actually know what that normalization will give us. Because if we integrate it over the full space, so if r was infinite, we would get 1. Because we would get uh, uh, hn in the product with itself, because then L lr becomes again the identity operator and we get 1. So this is just going to be 1 over what we get when we get take the full integral, which is a gamma function. So which is n factorial or whatever. I mean. Yeah, n factorial. So we know those eigenvalues. Um, if you plot them, so fix some r and look at what the lambda and r, they are decreasing, monotone decreasing. And when r, if r is very large, then typically for n small, you already have captured most of the functions, so you get an integral very close to 1. If you're much bigger than, if n is much bigger than r squared over 2, you have something very, very uh, small. And you can, what you find is that they decay to 0 over a zone that is of the order of r. And that corresponds exactly in this picture that we had in time frequency space, this disk. The Hermite functions live really on annuli in time frequency space. And it's only when their order is compatible with the radius here that you don't capture the full norm. And once they're much bigger, you have essentially zero of the norm when you localize on this ring. So it gives you a very nice interpretation of what this is. Um, such a localization operator turns out to be interesting for applications in, in a signal process. And this is a little bit an oops. So uh, these have interesting applications uh, for signal processing. Yes. Why is not one using uh, like a smooth cutoff in R? Well, it could be Gaussian. It could be Gaussian. It, it could be. Things would be simpler without uh, the gamma function. I mean, there would be well, more explicit integral. Anyways. They might be, yes. And in fact, you can do that. Every, anything that's rotationally invariant will do, okay. the whole thing will work through. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, the reason I, I, I searched. I, I first defined them with a, a sharp cutoff is because they were at first, now we have other applications for them, but at first they were motivated by what I'm going to say now. Um, 
And that harks back to a mention I made last time when people were interested in uh, uh, doing explicit localization in uh, so working on finite time intervals of what I said prolate spheroidal wave functions. And uh, so, and, and the work of Dave Thompson, which was preceded by the work of Landau, Henry Landau, Henry Pollack, and Dave Slapian. Um, they were interested in the problem of trying to find uh, good functions to describe the physical situation of looking at signals, functions, which they knew were limited in frequency. So they knew they were looking at f such that uh, if you looked at their Fourier transform and you multiplied them with psi below some cutoff, that gave you f hat again. So these are band limited functions. But they were going to observe such functions. So uh, the set of f for which this is true, let's call them uh, b omega. So this, is, this defines that set. And they were interested, so, uh, so observe for f in b omega, just the characteristic function in minus tt. Because, well, they were going to observe these functions over a finite time interval. And one thing they wanted to know is how big is that space? Can we prove things about how many uh, uh, how large that space is, how many independent functions you can find in there, can you construct them, can you find a nice orthonormal basis for that space and so on. So... Here, when you wrote uh, f belongs to b, t, you mean? No. So, you, what you will do, you observe this, okay. but four functions that are in there. And so that's the interplay of projections into the, the two sides. And, and so there were, I mean, if you, there are old papers, there's even a paper by uh, Peter Lax that actually, once I was talking about it with him and he said, oh, we had an old paper that was completely bypassed, of course, by the work of Lando Pollack and Slipian, but about this, this question. So people were very interested in, in the operator. If I define now, so in L2 of R, let me define PT to be the operator acting on arbitrary, so F in L2. I define PT of F by the characteristic function for T smaller than T times F. And I define Q omega of f by the, func by the fact that in Fourier transform it consists with multiplying by this. So the b omega are the functions, this is a projector operator, are the functions in the space on which q omega projects. So they were interested, so people were interested in finding what is the maximum norm for if I start with a function of norm 1 and I let q omega act on it in pt, what's the maximum I can get? What that really amounts to is that you want to study properties of this operator, the operator times its adjoint. I mean, so you want to study this operator. So f 
uh, this squared is the same thing as f with uh, pt q omega and then the same operator adjoint but the pt is combined to pt and I get q omega again. So they wanted to know what can I say about the spectrum of this operator and what can I say about its eigenvalues how many eigenvalues are there that are close to one you want them to be close to one because you'd like for the interval where you observe them to have observed most of the behavior of the function so you don't want to lose too much and functions for which you would lose very much are functions you don't care about and um, so the uh, so people were very interested in this, this in finding eigenvectors and I, the spectrum of this. And what uh, uh, Henry Landau and uh, Henry Pollack realized, and David Slepian, is that this operator commutes, in fact, with a very special uh, second-order differential equation, differential operator with non-constant coefficients. I mean, for some miracle. I mean, just it does. And so that happened to be a, 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 a function, a, a differential uh, operator that people had looked at for uh, uh, mechanical properties and for which they called the eigenfunctions the prolate Freudal wave functions. But since it commuted with that operator, that meant that the prolate Freudal wave functions were going to be eigenfunctions of this operator. And that made it possible to look at the spectrum of this operator very nicely. But the spect and the spectrum of this operator has eigenvalues that are close to 1 and then decay and get close to 0 and the place where it drops, so here, this happens at about n, about equal to um, 2 t omega over pi. But the width of the region here turns out to be more narrow. You see there my region, I didn't tell you where they dropped, but the width was of order r, but where they drop is for n about uh, r squared over 2. So it was about square root of the size. Here it's of the order of log of t omega, so much more narrow. It turns out that these functions, uh, because what it tells you is how many possibly independent functions can I have if I only am going to observe from minus t to t in the band limited function space. So it gives you a limit on how many functions you can have. Um, now, I, I remember these, these, these numbers always uh, so easily because in all cases, this case here, I had my disk. I mean, I also have my explicit formula, but even if I don't remember the explicit formula, it's the area of the disk divided by 2 pi. In this case here, I am implicitly defining in time frequency space a rectangle from minus tt to minus omega to omega, a rectangle that has area 4t omega and I divide it by 2 pi. The number of degrees of freedom that you have when you look at a local region in time frequency space is the area of that divided by 2 pi. Now if you want to insist on defining areas like that in time frequency and so on, it doesn't apply anymore. I mean, reasonable things. Um, and that actually is... Yes? Can you say a bit about why you have this log t omega with I, I, for that, you have to start looking at the analysis of this 
and at eigenvalues. It comes out. It's not something I can prove in a few rules. It, it's actually something that you, you, it, it happens to be the case. It's extraordinarily well localized. I mean, I wish I did have log, I don't have log. Is this phenomenon uh, general? Is that a universal? No, I mean, what happens with these proletroidal ones is really very particular. You can do similar things. I mean, people have tried to do similar things in more dimensions and so on, but I don't think it ever becomes as nice as in one dimension and with the proletroidals. But the, the, what, what, what is, uh, however, what's the inconvenience here is that the eigenfunctions and uh, the eigenfunctions themselves depend on the value of omega and t. I mean, of course, if you if you shrink omega, then you can expand t by a scaling argument. So things depend on the product only. But if you have changed the value of the product, then the eigenfunctions change. And what was the nice thing about these localization operator was, yes, they don't localize exactly on the rectangle you get for band limited for, for looking at one versus the other variable and so on, but they are the same eigenfunctions no matter what r you take, which is really nice. I mean, because it means you can localize in different areas in different ways. And, and uh, Also, I have defined the localization operator around zero. But it's very simple, of course, if you want to localize on a disk elsewhere, you just move the whole thing with a shift and, uh, and, and so on. The whole th the, all these commutation relations work beautifully. Okay, so I, I, I will uh, um, now come back to the question that I kind of tried sweeping under the rug and then you teased it out last time. Uh, of what is the special role of 2 pi in the product of tau and omega when I define these orthonormal bases. Because now we can understand and actually we can use the result that we proved for uh, uh, our localization operator to do that. What we find if we look at L our LR operator So our LR operator, we now know a lot about. We know its eigenfunctions. We have these lambda and r's. And so we can find the trace of LR. And it is going to be r squared over 2 plus order r. Namely, that's how many, uh, that's how many I have that are close to one. And each one gives me uh, uh, an, an extra one. And then I have a zone of order R where things decay. And then the decay is exponential. So I, I don't have to worry about a tail. If I have an orthonormal basis, then this is also going to be the WMN LR WMN. And my operator LR is a positive operator, so I don't have to worry about uh, uh, things that are have a trace but are not trace class, and so everything is nice and positive. Okay, now, if my w's are nicely localized in time frequency, then w00 is nicely localized here. wmn is going to be localized m taus away and n omegas up. So if I have this, this disk, then I expect, and you can, you can write it out, it's going to be mn, the integral over the disk with radius r of the wmn 
and the w the while operators t nu g squared d t d nu this is going to give me something that is mostly one if this point lies within my disk mostly zero if it lies far away and i may have there's a zone here where i will get contributions that are between zero and one but that zone the number of points i have in a zone that lie within a certain distance of the uh, circumference is going to be of order r so i'll get that this is going to be equal to the area of the disk divided by, well, how many points will I have? Well, I will have, since each of these cells is tau omega wide, has a dimension of tau omega, divided by tau omega, and then I'll have something of order r. And so I get that area disk, which is pi r squared over tau omega, has to be equal to r squared over 2 plus order r. And if I divide by r squared, then I find that tau omega has to be 2 pi plus order 1 over r. And since I'm talking about constant in the limit that I take disks that are big enough, I need to find that tau, pi, tau omega is 2 pi. So, I mean, and it's something that in quantum mechanics you know also. If you look at, at Weyl's formula for the number of bound states of a Hamiltonian, you look at the classical Hamiltonian, you look where its energy is negative, you divide by 2 pi and that gives you an approximation, a semi-classical approximation for the number of bound states. It's the same argument. Okay, so we have revisited this. We have found that for orthonormal basis, you only can have 2 pi. It also tells you the same argument, tells you that uh, this, this, so in, in, if you now look, if you now make a, this is not the time frequency plane. This is a plane for the parameters tau and omega. And I'm going to make a uh, uh, properties. I want to look at re different regions in this parameter plane. Properties for the family of functions that I get by discreetly moving my window by integer steps with width tau in time and omega in frequency. Then we have this hyperbola here, omega tau equals to 2 pi. If, my, if I build a, a, fun, a family of functions, w, m, n, with omega tau bigger than 2 pi, then it's clear that the ones that lie within the disk cannot span the full set of functions, of eigenfunctions, because I don't have enough of them. I mean, my, my mesh is too large, too few functions are localized within the disk, and the disk needs r over squared over two eigen, I mean, uh, functions that are localized there. So then I have, uh, I'm not, we do not span, so these w, m, n do not span h if my product omega here in this region here is the only place where orthonormal bases are possible but as we saw last time they cannot be very nice 
meaning they either decay badly in time or badly in frequency. They can't dec have good decay in both, decay faster than 1 over x or 1 over xi. And then what happens here? Well, the same argument will tell me that I'm trying to cram too many functions in a space that's just not big dimensional enough, not large dimensional enough. So if I can lo look at all the WMNs within with, that have a localization within that, that, that disk, then I have more than the dimension of the eigenfunctions of the localization operator that have eigenvalue bigger than a half. And so they're not linearly independent. So here they have no independence. And so, which is sometimes called overcomplete. Okay, I think this is a, a, a nice point to break, per, per, per first because I, I'm, I'm thirsty and, uh, and, and second because we'll shift to a slightly different thing. So we have introduced quite a bit of machinery and all of the machinery you've seen we will use again in different places. Uh, and I thought maybe now that I have uh, made up my mind of, of, of what we will we'll talk about, I would tell you a little bit of the list of things we'll see uh, uh, next week as well. If there is something uh, that you would like me to talk about that's not on the list, please let me know uh, and I'll try to prepare and, and, and squeeze it in. Uh, so my email address is very simple. It's my first name at math because I'm considered a mathematician these days. Well, I pretend to be a mathematician. I have a, a little dirty secret. I have no degree in math. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, <gasps> so all my degrees are in physics, but... Uh, but at least you have some degrees. Some people have not even have a PhD, famous people. <laughs> That's true, and, uh, and more famous people. Than <laughs> Vastly more famous. Okay, um, so uh, this afternoon I was thinking, since these are the Adama lectures, of telling you some work I've done in uh, inverse problems, uh, ill posed problems, au sens d'Adama. And um, uh, that has to do also with time frequency localization because that comes in all the time. Um, so uh, inverse problems. Then um, next week uh, I, was, I, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the construction of Wilson bases. And uh, their, their LIGO use, although I will say very, very little about their LIGO use because I was not involved with that at all. I mean, it was a major surprise to me that all of a sudden they turned out to be really useful, although I understand why they are useful. But, uh, and uh, I also would like to tell you, and that will use these localization and these rotation operators again, something about what we call synchro squeezing. for signal analysis. And I can give, I mean, so let me say a few words about that so that you know what it's about, and, but then I'll come back to it next week. Um, I showed you the very first time I showed you the spectrograms. And if you remember, there were things that in time frequency were bands and and these had to do with the fact that in time the, lo the, the, the spectral properties, the frequency properties of the signal were changing in time and that's why as time goes on the frequency profile changes. But they also were all kind of blurry. I mean, there was nothing sharp there. You didn't see, oh, this beautiful shiny uh, and so on. It was all 
all things that I have to draw with by putting my, 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 my chalk flat. Um, there are applications where we really want to know things more precisely. I might say, well, the uncertainty principle means you can do it precisely. Exactly, of course you can't. But uh, there are, on the other hand, applications where you know you would be able to do things precisely. I mean, uh, people do what in, in optics, people do super resolution, for instance. They go beyond the Rayleigh uh, a limit on, on resolving sources because they know that what they see is two sources. If they have two pinpoint sources and they see something that is blurrier, then they can figure out where the two point point sources had to be in order to get the best response, the, the closest response to what they actually see. So that in a sense is fitting. If you have something with very few parameters, then you can look at what you get and fit uh, those, those parameters as best possible. What we want to do is not really fitting, we have many more parameters than that, but we want to make use of the fact that we have an idea of what our signal looks like. And so in some medical applications, we know that our signals, for instance, uh, an example is an electrocardiogram. I mean, you know that the signal looks like, I mean, I work with doctors and they have an exquisite way of drawing this. And, and if I do it, I hope nobody here is a, is there, are there any doctors in the room? I mean, no. Okay, so then you won't mind that I draw an electrocardiogram like this because. Uh, so you see this thing repeat. And you've all seen on television series, I mean, every ER series on television, you see machines that so bleep, 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 and it repeats periodically, except it's not quite periodic. If it was periodic, it would be so easy to analyze. It's not. I mean, in fact, and this is well known, the difference, the distance between peaks, successive peaks, is an indication of respiration. And in fact, one over the distance of the peaks is a first measurement of your respiration. Uh, and in fact, that's often how your respiration is measured from your electrocardiogram, because although you might think it's so much easier to measure air coming in and out than the electrical properties of your heart. Electrocardiograms are very easy. They just put electrodes and they measure. Uh, measuring the air and so on is something for which they have to put an apparatus in front of you and it's very cumbersome and it's not uh, something you can forget about, which you can do about the electrocardiogram. So they measure respiration by these intervals between successive peaks, which means they already use the fact that it's not periodic. If it's not exactly periodic, then time frequency tools are much, have much more problems. So what we know is that we have signals that look like some basic shape, which we don't know exactly, which repeat in time. So we have an S, let's say that S is periodic, but we have a rewarping in time that is not quite, so phi prime is not constant. We have an amplitude that may change, and we typically have the sum of a few of such uh, signals. So AK also uh, not constant. But the fact that you have a model like so we don't have parameters. I'm not saying how AK should use or how SK as my, and so on, but I still have an idea. And we try to make the, 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 the reading of the signal precise, more precise that way. We have come, we still have a lot to do, and some of the tools I've described will come in in, in how we are approaching this at present. <coughs> We've come so far that uh, uh, my collaborator, in this, who is not only, who holds only, not only a PhD in applied math, but also um, a medical doctor, he was a, a, a in radiography, so he's a fully trained specialist in radiography and medical, uh, and has a medical degree. Um, we can now, from electrocardiograms taken from a pregnant mother, uh, extract the uh, heartbeat of the fetus which is a very, very, uh, very small signal and very uh, high SN, uh, very low SNR, very low signal to noise ratio. And of course, it's dominated by the, the electrocardiogram of the mother. Um, so, uh, and, and which is diagnostically important because right now, 
for babies that they expect have a heart problem, the only way they can measure during delivery the heartbeat of the baby is actually by, by putting a probe and, and with all the dangers and so on. So if you can do it by signal analysis, that's much better. So I'll come, this is what I, I was planning to do at the very end. And surprisingly, some of the machinery of the rotations and so on that we have seen today will come back in there. So that's the plan for the remaining lectures. <coughs> but today I wanted to talk about, uh, yes, you had a question? Oh, uh, I wanted to talk about inverse problems. and time frequency localization. The time frequency localization comes in as a non-essential way, although it's essential to the problems that we solve, it's not essential to the, the thing we did. But I felt it's the only thing I have done in my career that, that relates directly to Hadamard. So I felt I owed it to him. To, uh, um, so I've talked and I've given you examples of sound signals, of other things that are localized in time and in frequency. I've also shown you that we can fabricate little nuggets of things that are localized in time frequency. So, but in many cases, we are interested, we, we might be looking at things like these T new windows. Um, we will be almost forced to look at situations where uh, we have a redundant family of functions. So I might be looking at, for instance, these, I mean, I discretize. And, but I want to discretize very finely because I want to be able to put things in very special locations. So that means that I might take tau and omega so that our product is much smaller than 2 pi. I will have an enormous redundancy of functions. I, there are done many, many ways in which I can, if, I is, if I'm given a function, in which I can write a linear combination such that of these building blocks, that gives me the function, or for which the distance between these things is small. So let me, gives me the function if I have no noise, but in practice you always have noise. So you don't want to exactly reconstruct it, but you might want to reconstruct it up to a certain margin. But I even then there's still many, many ways. You could find, and this is something that in some cases is useful, you could try to find the uh, way of writing it so that the constants have smallest little L2 norm. And for that we have very good methods, uh, operator methods. I mean, what you do is you write, uh, um, you define this operator T from L2 of R to little L2 of Z2 that maps f to the inner products with this this sequence and you study properties of that operators and through properties of that operator you can then find a procedure that will give you this type of reconstruction for a function with the smallest little L2 norm for the coefficients. Fine. It just turns out that in a ton of other applications, that is not really what you want to do. Because the L2, little L2 norm for a sequence is the norm which often we prefer to work with because it's so easy. Little L2 is a Hilbert space for heaven's sake. I mean, it's, it's, it's 
almost kindergarten stuff. I mean, you love it because it's so easy. Uh, but in a little Altuno, because you think, I mean, think of what, what the contribution is of every single uh, uh, coefficient in the sequence. Uh, if a coefficient is very tiny, because the square function looks like this, very tiny coefficients don't contribute much to your L2 norm. And so saying, I want the minimum L2 norm, the coefficient sequence of the minimum L2 norm, means that you don't really care about having it a lot of dust at very small values. And uh, you could say, well, let me get that dust and then put it to zero. Well, why, why first compute it and then put it to zero? Why not do something else instead? And <coughs> recently, uh, people have become very interested in trying to, so given f, try to find, try to construct Well, actually, even more, given an f which is the effect of some operator on a function f. And this is most of the time what you have in, in physics. Most of the time you're interested in something, an object, that you observe through a telescope, through a microscope, whatever way and so on, but you want the original thing, not what you have measured from it. And in fact, what you, you know is that uh, uh, f is the thing you wanted to plus some noise. Given that you measured this, which you know is some known op operator acting on f plus noise, you try to construct uh, f or an, an approximation the best possible approximation f sharp to f. Now, best possible approximation, what do I mean by that? I might, in the case where I know it was well localized in time frequency, want to construct an f sharp that is a linear combination of such but with the coefficient sequence as sparse as possible. So it might be It might be that I know that the thing I'm looking at is something that in some building blocks of this type, which I construct because they make sense for my problem, and they could be time frequency localized, they could be wavelets. Actually, for what I'm going to do, it doesn't matter what they are. But often we get that they are well localized, uh, that they have a sparse expansion because they have good localization in space and in spatial frequency and try to do that. Now, the, the little L2 norm is not a good idea for this. But it turns out that the little L1 norm is a better idea. And the reason for that is that if you look at the function, so this is the function t and this is the function t squared, it makes you pay much more for small coefficients than the, uh, the L2 norm does. So the idea is you, so you model the whole thing by saying, so you want uh, that f hat F sharp, sorry, F sharp. Um, so you want 
siemens or let's call them c lambdas c lambdas where lambda is in some index set so that a on sum over lambda c lambda and let's call them these building blocks uh, uh, phi lambdas so or well let's call them w lambda so i'm going to call these things w lambdas so i want to construct them so that this minus the observation is small and typically I like to put this in L2 norm still, L2 or little L2, depending on how I measure it. Um, because uh, typically we know, well, we believe we know, and that the, the noise we have is close to white Gaussian noise. And so then it makes sense to look in L2 norm. This is small and then you put in an extra parameter and you put here the sum over all lambda c lambda so that this is minimized so that's how you model the problem now why you model it that way i mean i've given you some arguments already and let me give you a few more the first is I do want, I believe that making such linear combinations of my building blocks is a good idea. I believe it will be fairly sparse. And I know that the L1 norm is a better way of measuring sparsity than L2 norm. Uh, one reason I know that that's the case is that if you think, let's forget about the operator for the moment. If you think, uh, and let's imagine that, which isn't always the case, but let's imagine that we have an orthonormal uh, uh, basis. So, uh, so justification. Suppose the UN are an orthonormal basis. And I want to find, and so uh, then the argmin of sum over C n u n minus f squared in little l2, uh, well, in, yeah, little l2, plus tau uh, sum over, so tau uh, sum over the ncn, so the L1 norm of the coefficient c could c. So because I have an orthonormal basis, this is going to be the argmin of, well, if I expand the whole thing in un, then I'll get cn minus fun, so I get here sum over cn minus fun squared plus tau cn and if i now do a uh, a dirty a quick and dirty minimization of that i mean this is of course not differentiable but if i don't care for the moment <coughs> and i can justify this but uh, then uh, differentiating this so if cn is different from zero where i can do this and i look at the minimizing equation then i get uh, cn minus fun is um, plus tau is zero if cn is positive if cn is negative, then absolute value cn is just negative cn. So then I get uh, cn minus fun negative tau is zero if cn is negative. So this top thing gives me cn equals fun 
minus tau. But only if Cn is positive. So for, for this to be positive, it, I need that Fun is bigger than tau. Here I get Cn is Fun plus tau. But that's if Cn is negative. So in order for this to be consistent, I need Fun to be less than negative tau. So you see there's between these two consistency uh, conditions, there's a gap. Namely, Fun in absolute value lies between, uh, Fun lies between negative tau and tau. And then I can have neither this case nor that case. Well, I can't have Cn different from zero, I get Cn equals zero. So that's a kind of dirty derivation. Now, in order to uh, do it correctly, you would have to work with the <coughs> subdifferential and you, so on, you get exactly the same thing. So what you get is that the minimizer for this gives you Cn is F u n, and then you subtract from that tau times the sine of F u n. If F u n is bigger than tau, and otherwise you get zero. So what that tells you is that you would get exactly what you would have gotten if you didn't have that term, except for an extra thresholding. And the thresholding that I'm seeing here is the following. I mean, so if this is uh, so f u n, the possible values of f u n, and here I'm telling you what c n will be. So this is the diagonal that I would have gotten for Cn if I didn't have this extra term. By having the extra term, I am subtracting a little something here. I'm adding a little something there and putting zero in between. This is called soft thresholding. And it's telling you that if my original function for some of the UNs had lots of fluff in it, I'm cutting it out. So it is a, uh, I'm just saying as a justification, a motivation. It is something that cuts out small terms. <coughs> Another justification Another justification is something that comes from the area of what's called compressed sensing. So still justification. Um, and this is something that has had an immense impact in, in, uh, uh, in a whole range of signal processing areas. Um, the idea is if indeed I work like I'm doing with my, I mean, if I'm looking at very, very redundant uh, blocks here, that means that I'm looking at a very, very large coefficient space. So I'm thinking of working with very many, very long vectors. I mean, so this is a column vector in the way people have of, of drawing it. But the true space in which I work, what I observe is actually smaller dimensional. So my operator A is something that is a block matrix. Well, it's a matrix that has, it's much wider than it's tall. And I observe this.
then it is of course obvious that although there might well be solutions, uh, there will be a, a, a multitude of solutions because the problem is underdetermined. However, it might be that we know ahead of time that your solution, the thing that you're looking for, has very few entries. In fact, much fewer than this dimension. And then you could ask yourself, can I, now that I know I don't have that many uh, possible numbers I have to find, can I find them from these? It's hard to say that you have only a, fine, a small number of degrees of freedom because it, these coefficients could be anywhere. So any of these dimensions might be used. So you have a large number of degrees of freedom, but you will not use many of them at the same time. And so the question is, if you know, if you have this matrix A and you want, you want to find X once Y is given, can you do that? And the idea is, uh, and, and how would you find it? And the answer is, if A, so for special matrices, for a, a, a large class, of matrices A, it turns out that the optimal sparse X is the argmin of a uh, x minus y squared plus tau x1 where you have to choose tau in the right way. So doing what I was doing there with the L1 norm turns out to be the good thing to do for these. But although this is a large class of matrices A, it's not all A. And in fact, in practice, it's almost impossible to verify, impossible to verify that A is in this class. Worse. If I have, if my problem A, my problem, my physical problem is of the sort, I mean, here I'm not really talking about a physical problem depending, uh, decomposing into these time frequency blocks, but in many cases you have a physical problem where your operator A comes from the uh, uh, transfer function of, of, the, of the, the telescope, of the microscope or whatever. Um, in those cases, you know that A will not have this property. So, what I'm saying here is that the optimal sparse X is finding the solution with smallest, what people sometimes call the X zero norm. Well, because it's not a norm. The X0, the idea is you take for every coefficient, you take nothing if the coefficient is zero, and you take a one if it's there. So you take, uh, you just count the, the coefficients. Well, that's not a norm. I mean, it's by, by, by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, you can't really call it a norm, and, and the notation is, is, but so what's special about this compressed sensing is that you have this, collection of matrices for which you can prove that going for the smallest zero norm is achieved by going for the smallest one norm, which is a true norm and which is convex and which, I mean, so this is something you can solve. And this you can never hope to, to, to get around to. 
So, well, I mean, unless you have very special aid. Um, Minimize also on tau. What do you do with it? You don't know tau, you say. Yeah, uh, so there is a link between tau. In fact, what, what you do is um, for some tau. So how would I find oh, wait, the tau has nothing to do with the tau of the W? I guess. No, I'm no. oh, sorry, uh, uh, gamma. Uh, what happens is that <coughs> You can look at, and in these problems, you can look at three different ways of asking the problem. You can say that you want to minimize this argmin for x1s smaller than some r. That's one problem. Another problem you can ask yourself is you can look for the argmin of the L1 norm, given that Ax minus Y2 is smaller than some epsilon. That's also a problem you can ask. And then the, the final one is argmin of Ax minus Y2 squared plus gamma X1. In every case, you have to pick a parameter. What you can show is that the solution set, if you let r vary, or you let epsilon vary, or you let gamma vary, is the same. So what you can do is you can look for a particular gamma, what the solution is. You can then compute what Ax minus y2 is, and that is the value for which you would have found the minimizer here. Or you can look at what x1 is, and that's the r for which you would have found the minimizer there. But what the correspondence is depends on your operator a. But because the whole thing is convex, and because uh, you're looking at minimizers every time, you can show that you have this equivalence of minimizers. So in that sense, gamma determines r, but I can't give you an explicit formula, because it would depend on a. <coughs> but I like to look at the problem in this way because uh, it's a penalized rather than constrained situation. And that is typically, uh, numerically, much easier to implement. Because constraints are things that you have to work harder for in order to... Uh, and in many of these situations... So I've now finished with my justification for looking at this. From now on, I feel I have justified it. I'm going to look at L1 penalized minimization. Um, the, uh, in, in many of the situations, what happens is that the problem, the original problem, is truly an ill-posed inverse problem, uh, in the sense of Adamach. In, in, uh, and, but, but where the, the term that you impose regularizes it, namely minimizing that quantity gives you something that gives you an approximate minimizer of this, but now you become continuous in the, all the parameters of your original uh, problem. So that was my justification. So I'm interested in finding minimizers of this and I'll put L1 norm here. In my original, in the problem here, which we actually, we have worked with exactly this formulation in, in, in some <coughs> geophysics problems where, in fact, we were looking at... Uh, an, so we were decomposing into elementary building blocks that had uh, nice time frequency localization. And then uh, the operator itself was the whole operator of reading from the structure of the Earth, which we were modeling with these blocks, 
uh, the seismic traces. So for that, we relied on the geophysicists who had great models for that operator. That altogether came in the operator A. X was our coefficient vector. And we wanted our coefficient vector to be sparse. And uh, the problem on which we applied it, uh, just an aside here, these are papers with Hus Nolet. So if you look for papers with uh, uh, Gustolet as uh, one who is in Nice, he's now just retired, and, uh, and, and myself as author, you'll come across them. Uh, the idea there was that you, if you look at the whole Earth and you look at, I mean, there are all these layers in the Earth which are more or less known at what depth they are. I mean, we're not talking about finding oil layers. I mean, oil layers all happen in, in this, this, this thick of, this of the chalk here. We're talking about deeper structure than that. Um, they, uh, they look at the seismic traces registered all over the Earth from really large earthquakes. And so those have enormous energy and things that happen here uh, get, get propagated and so on and measured there. And so from what you register, you will get some imprint of what you went through. And so they modeled all that. And what they wanted to hope was to find evidence of what are called plumes. So in, in the, the, there is a, a belief, a strong belief, that in places like where you have island chains like Hawaii and, 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 and so on, there is a plume of, of, of material that comes up from the mantle, that wells up, and that causes these volcanic islands to be formed. And with tectonic drift, these things move away, and so you have chains of islands that get formed. Um, but they're very localized in space. And so the idea was by trying to build models with localized things, in space uh, and imposing sparsity because those plumes are sparse. They don't exist in many places. By giving the model the freedom to put these plumes in if it needed them to see whether we could tease them out. It turned out that the data were not sufficient, didn't have sufficient high resolution to get to that. But that was what the effort was trying to do. And so what we really had was an operator A that acted on a coefficient vector of the building blocks we were using, which we knew to be sparse. And so that's why we put in this penalty and trying to reproduce the data and see where the model would pick the sparse elements to be put. Okay. The new here is our theta, the two or three dimensions in space. Uh, and also frequency. So spatial dimension and spatial frequency. Because uh, these, these, uh, these earthquakes, they measure them in different, uh, they decompose, I mean, they're dispersion relations. And so different spatial frequencies get uh, dispersed at different uh, speeds. They get they're transmitted at different speeds. And so when you, you measure, you can actually, in their model, you decompose also in, in spatial frequency. But the plume is nearly fixed? So the plume is fixed in, in, in so on. So, the, so, so what you observe uses, uh, um, yeah, the, the plume is fixed, but uh, we, we have building blocks at different scales. We worked with wavelets there. So we had fine scale and large scale wavelets. So that is the, the, the frequency there, mm -hmm. the second parameter. In any case, that's what you want to, to work with. Um, so you want to find algorithms for solving that. So algorithms. Uh, you want to prove convergence. And you want to also prove that it's regularizing. So that you have, in the case, typically the operator A is an operator, even if A has no kernel, which is often the case. I mean, not the case in the overdetermined situation, then you do have a kernel. But when A has no kernel, then you typically still have eigenvalues that can go very small. And so uh, the operator is not invertible, doesn't have a bounded inverse. And so you still do need regularization in order to, and that's what the penalty term 
takes care of. But then another thing that came up later, <coughs> so this was a, uh, some work I did in the early O's uh, with uh, Christine, uh, with Michel de Vries. The, 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 the brother of Lucette de Vries and uh, Christine de Mol. Um, and uh, that algorithm was actually an algorithm that also had, uh, we were not aware of it at the time, but had been proposed by other people, although not with a proof of convergence in infinite dimensions. So we were lucky in that we still had done something that nobody else had done. Uh, so there's work, Donahoe, um, there was um, Donahoe and students, um, there was work by Rob Nowak and Figueredo. I mean, and no doubt, still other people. Um, but then we found that engineers actually very often, uh, uh, instead of using the algorithms for minimizing L1 norms, are slow. I mean, uh, much slower. Whenever you have an, an L2 penalty, people use conjugate gradient methods and things go very fast numerically. So what uh, many engineers do when they have to solve an L1 norm uh, is to uh, actually put in a weighted, a reweighted L2 norm. So an, uh, an iteratively reweighted, they turn it into what they call an iteratively reweighted least squares algorithm. So many of the algorithms, and I'll come back to that, for solving this are, um, are iterative. That's to say you start with initial guess, you compute uh, a better guess and so on. So you compute, you will compute x n's. And what you hope is that uh, uh, you compute x n plus 1 computed from <coughs> x n and the data. And then you hope that to prove that x n goes to a minimizer x sharp. So what, what uh, iteratively reweighted these square methods would do is they say, OK, at the end step, let's minimize this. But instead of having to worry about the x case, the L1 norm is a nuisance because it's not differentiable. They say, let's make it an L2 thing. Let's just divide it by what, I mean, if the thing converges, then in the limit, this will just give us, I mean, if the Xn conversion, this will just give us the absolute value of Xn k. Um, and then they say, well, of course, we might not have if this is zero, we are in trouble, or if it's, or it's very small. So let's put here an epsilon, a square and a square root. <coughs> and so at every step, you put a different weight in to... Uh, the problem is that this, of course, is not going to converge. I mean, it's going to converge to the problem where your weight would be the sum over x k squared over exactly this. I mean, if you're lucky, I mean, but you can prove that it converged to that. And that immediately gives you all the small fluff that you typically get. It doesn't give you the L1 norm. So 
part of your justification for the L1 norm is gone. Uh, however, if you take the epsilon away, you can really run into trouble. So uh, what we then did is we found that there's a way of defining epsilon n's in such a way that you, the method will converge and thus converge to the right limit. And again, that was something that was unknown that you could do that, that you could do an iteratively reweighted least squares algorithm for solving L1 penalized problems that uh, uh, gave you the right solution. So. Epsilon <coughs> n is fixed or is, uh, is it decreasing according to iteration, but it depends upon a or? Epsilon, epsilon n depends on the previous solutions. The problem is that you want epsilon n's to decrease, of course. You want it to go to zero, of course, but it shouldn't go to zero too fast. So it's actually going to depend on the norm of previous solutions. And, uh, but it works. And in speed, it turns out, I mean, so then you can, on this, you can apply uh, a conjugate gradient. I mean, so you can do uh, 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 a couple of steps with a weight, conjugate gradient, and then readjust the weight, conjugate gradient again, and so on. And so this uh, work was done in a paper by uh, my student Sergei Voronin and myself, which should be coming out soon. I mean, it took a while after he finished his thesis for it to be written up. And uh, an improvement on this has done, been done by, so we proved uh, convergence for the original method. But if you want to do conjugate gradient, but not to conjugate gradient to convergence, and then go to the next iteration, then, so you want to just do a couple of steps, then that was done by uh, Massimo Fournazier and one of his students. So, and then, then you get significant speed up compared to its standard L1 methods. <coughs> so, okay. So there are a number of ways in which you can attach these problems. And <coughs> optimization theory is in fact uh, a, a very nice uh, branch of applied mathematics in its own right. And uh, there are very slick ways of approaching those. In, 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 uh, uh, um, what I will show you is a, a fairly pedestrian way, but something that explains what, what's going on. So, <coughs> if I want to look at ax minus y squared plus gamma x1. First of all, I like actually to put a two here because uh, in what I did up there, I now realize I forgot conveniently a factor two. Uh, it should have been two Cn minus Fun plus tau equals zero. And so I should have thresholded tau over two. And uh, it's because I had forgotten to put this factor two in there. I mean, I like to put that factor and I don't have to write the one over two every time. So argument of that. So, um, let me define this as a functional of x. And let me also define a functional g of x and another vector. You see, there I could actually write a minimizer because I didn't really have an operator. I mean, I, I was nicely diagonal in my C and so I could minimize. But here I have this 
A, if I try to do the same trick here, then, I mean, I could. I mean, if we try to write the same trick, minimizing, then I would get, uh, uh, so I have uh, here, um, x times a star a x minus 2x a star y. Let me assume that I'm real because, uh, I mean, complex doesn't, makes it slightly more complex, but uh, it doesn't make it, it, uh, it essentially different. Uh, plus y squared, which of course for minimization doesn't matter. And then plus 2 gamma sum over k xk. So here I have sum over k xk and then this k minus 2 sum over k xk and this k. And if I write my minimizers then I get uh, a star a xk times 2 because it's quadratic minus the two I have here, so let me forget about it, to a star y k, and then plus two gamma and sine x k, and that should be zero. And so what I get by the same uh, uh, argument as before, if this at x k is, um, <coughs> okay, so sh this should be zero. So actually, let me be a little bit more careful. Uh, let me say plus two gamma is zero if xk is positive. But two disappears. Thank you, thank you. Minus gamma is zero if xk is negative. And, okay, so if xk is positive, then I get that xk is equal to uh, Okay, so how did that work again? Um, No, I'm not inverting anything. Uh, I'm trying to write one formula that will uh, in in incorporate everything and that will otherwise be completely useless. Um, okay, so if uh, Okay, gamma is positive. Okay, if xk is positive, then I have to satisfy this. So then gamma is going to be equal to that, which means this is also positive. So I can write that it's xk is going to be equal to this minus gamma the sine of xk plus a star y k minus a star a x k. Sorry. I mean, all I've done is written something simple more complicated, but it's true. That was if xk was positive. If xk is negative, then I have that gamma equals to what I have on this side. So I get minus a star y 
k a star a x k so what that means is that this thing is negative and xk is negative so the sign of this whole thing is negative and so saying i do this plus gamma is right again because everything cancels again so this is always true now if x if if neither of of these things is true then i get x so i, I will get xk equals zero if if this whole contraption doesn't have uh, uh, is, is not is not bigger than gamma, then I'll, I'll get x k zero. So I can write that this. So it is true that the what I call soft thresholding as gamma x k plus a star y k minus a star y a uh, x k is the minimizing equation for this, this functional. The way, I mean, so I didn't do it, I mean, I did it hand-waving here, but you can do it rigorously, except it will take me another board, um, by really looking at what happens when you, uh, you do a variation. So you say, let's add a little u to x, and you have to differentiate between those k for which xk is different from zero, because then you can make your u small enough, so you at u times t, you can make your t small enough that the sign of x plus u t, t k is the same as xk. But you can only do that if xk is not zero. If xk is zero, then you end up with a u and you get a different equation. And that's how you do it rigorously. But in the end, you do get this equation. That is the minimizing equation. But you see, this is a nuisance. Because you sit with this operator there. I mean, yes, I could try to define... Uh, uh, I mean, so... so uh, from this equation, immediately finding what 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 uh, what x should be is not not trivial. You can, of course, now this suggests that you define x n plus one k is as gamma x n k plus a star y k minus a star a x n k. So this, it suggests that you do this, but it's not clear that that's going to converge. So at least you have an iterative procedure, and that in fact was what had been proposed by a number of people, but you have to prove it, prove it converges. So that is what we're going to do now. So. So in, in such case, it's a proximal gradient operator also, so it's... Yes. But many of the proofs that you have for that are in finite dimension. And I want to prove it's going to converge in infinite dimension. Okay, f of x is, by definition, ax minus y squared plus gamma x1. Hmm? Thanks. And I want to get rid of this a star a. I want to, I mean, that is what's causing me the problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define something that looks like my, but I'll add some extra terms. I'm going to assume a less than one, 
And in fact, with different approaches, you can go to a less than square root 2. But for the proof I'm going to give you, a less than 1 works is easier. OK. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a term here that, because a is less than 1, is going to be positive, and that I hope will disappear in the limit. And that's going to get make, uh, eliminate my ax squared. So what I'm going to write here is an x minus a squared minus ax minus a squared. So, and what I will do is I will take, I will consider in particular x near with, I mean, so I will add a term that compares with the previous iterate. And so I'll define xn plus 1, sorry, is the argmin in x of this. And I now have a number of interesting observations that help me. I have that, <coughs> so f of x is always smaller than g of x, any a. I have that f of xn is equal to g of xn, xn. I have f of xn plus 1 which is the same thing as g of xn plus 1 xn plus 1 that is smaller than g of xn xn plus 1 uh, explain, sorry, xn plus 1 xn. So I didn't, I don't, yeah, okay. Uh, and g xn plus 1, because xn plus 1 is the minimizer, is smaller than g of xn xn, and that is fxn. So at least I see that my fxns decrease. Um, Next, let's look at what gxn plus 1 xn minus f of xn plus 1. Let's look at that. Well, since I defined that, that one from the other by adding that extra term, that is just x n plus 1 minus x n squared minus a times the same thing. And so that is less than 1 minus a squared 
And that's why I wanted that a was norm less than 1 times xn plus 1 minus xn squared. And so this is some constant, which is bigger than 0. And so now, because this is just the difference between these two, <laughs> oops, between, <laughs> between these two terms, and this difference is sandwiched between these two terms, I'm having now that the sum over x n plus one minus x n squared, Let, not sum yet, let's write this, is smaller than 1 over c, and I get f x n minus f x n plus 1. And that means that any finite sum I would write here is going to be equal to the same finite sum I would write here, which is bounded by 1 over c f of x1, because all those terms are positive. And so it follows that this is an, this infinite series converges. Excuse me. Yes. Maybe I may miss something, but from the previous line, as the norm of A is less than 1, you see that this is a contraction operator. So it must, if there is a fixed point, is the only solution, and there is an obvious fixed point. Uh, no, because A could, uh, a, a could, a could have eigenvalue. Uh, could but the norm of A is less than 1. Yes, so yes, but A point. could have eigenvalue 0. Uh, yeah, so I point. actually, I am, you're I right, you're, you know, you're right, I've done something really, really wrong here. This is not true. I mean, I'm subtracting that. So I'm, I've done something wrong. Uh, this is just simply not true as I've stated it. So what should I be doing instead? Um, no, it's true. It's true. Yeah. So C is less than 1. In the next line, you reverse uh, inequality. So you probably it should be larger than 1. Uh. Mustn't be negative? It mustn't be negative. Yeah. 1 minus. I have, yeah, I've, I've done something terrible. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. A uh, little, little. No, yeah, it's this that's bigger. This is what I should have done. And then everything is okay. Yes. Because it wasn't true the way I'd written it. Because if A, if I was looking, I mean, it's not true. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, so if I write U squared minus AU squared, that is not in general true. Because if I look at u that has eig as, as, an, as, as uh, eigenvalue 0, then I would be wrong. But you're right. If, if it had been true, then that's what I should have done. But uh, I, I made two mistakes that cancelled each other. I mean, uh, but thanks for catching them. And, and in fact, that's the whole, the whole point of introducing this, this concatenation, that we have a way of sandwiching xn plus x minus xn squared by something that's bounded and that, 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 that will uh, chain together.
Okay, so um, that doesn't tell me yet. So I do have uh, okay, so I have that. But I also have an equation for xn plus 1 and xn. Let me look at, at what gxa is again. If I write it out, you see the ax squared will drop out. So I get um, minus 2x a star y plus 2 gamma x1. plus x squared minus 2xa and then the ax squared drops out again plus 2x a star a a plus stuff without x. So that means that the minimizing equation well let's first rewrite this whole thing. I get uh, x squared <coughs> plus 2 um, minus 2 x a star y plus uh, minus a star a a and plus a and then plus 2 gamma x1 and we've seen a number of times how to get the minimizing equation of that what you get is that you write the whole quadratic thing and then you put a soft threshold. In. So the minimizing equation for that is uh, uh, x minimizer. So, uh, so minimizing, okay, so let's write the equation first. Um, x k equal soft thresholding with thresholding uh, step gamma of, and we get a 2 for minimizing that, so we get xk minus a star y uh, I have a problem now Okay, so let's do it. Okay, xk, 2xk minus 2 a star y k minus a star a k uh, so plus minus a k and then I have plus gamma is 0 if xk is positive. And so I get xk in that case is ak uh, plus a star yk minus a star a ak minus gamma and xk needs to be positive. So that means that this has to be bigger than gamma, and so I have soft thresholding of that. I have the whole same expression if with a plus gamma if xk is negative. And so, so I get that my minimizing equation is, now I'll write it here, xk is the soft thresholding gamma ak 
plus a star y k minus a star a a k. Great. That's my minimizing equation. So if I apply that to xn and xn plus 1, so a is xn and this is xn plus 1, I get that xn plus 1, the minimizer, is equal to xnk plus here. And so this is starting to look like what, so if I have convergence, then things will indeed converge to the right minimizing equation, if I have convergence, which I haven't proven yet. But I have squares. Yes, I wish they. Uh, that would be that would be great. I mean, it would be wonderful. But uh, but we have to to work a little harder. Yeah, no, but uh, that's exactly. I mean, we it would be wonderful, but we don't in general have that. So we do know that we do know that the difference between them goes to zero, but we don't know that they're summable. <coughs> but uh, okay, we have this component-wise. Uh, so how did it go again? Uh, we also know because, well, our, we have an, an uh, we know that f, all the f's are bounded, so we know that, know that the, all the, the L1 norms are bounded, so f of the xn's are all smaller than f of x1, and these are bounded, and so the L1 norms of all these things are bounded. X1, sorry. Because we know that we have a decreasing sequence. And so we have this, uh, and so we know that the uh, the L two norms are also bounded. All bounded by some, by some radius smaller than infinity, and so we know that we are going to have a weakly convergent subsequence. Okay. Um, it follows that uh, the x and l k uh, will converge to some x twiddle k as l goes to infinity. Weakly means what? Uh, it means that there exists uh, so there's a convergent subsequence. No. No.
uh, uh, no, uh, uh, weakly convergent means uh, so x and l. For uh, for any vector you can think of, oh. this will go to zero as l goes to infinity. <laughs> hmm? No. No, no, no. The the, the inner product. Oh yeah, but we can't do volume. We can't do weekly multiply to you. Weekly hmm? convergent to zero, not to zero to the. To, uh, weekly convergence, uh, uh, con uh, there exists a sequence that has a weak limit. You should subtract the limit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so here, the difference between, yes, you're right. I mean, that's what you meant, the difference should go to zero. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I had not. Uh... Okay, so. It, because uh, com taking in component is a particular uh, case of taking a sub uh, 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 an inner product, so this is true. Um, the when you apply an operator to a weakly convergent sequence, it's still weakly convergent. So um, because I have this relationship between every next iterate and the previous one, it will happen also that the x n l plus 1 k uh, will converge as well. Is that true? X n, yeah, I, I don't need that. I just need that x n, yeah, x n plus 1 minus x n goes to 0 in norm. So it means that this also has to converge to x twiddle k as l goes to infinity. And so it follows that x twiddle k will satisfy as gamma x twiddle k plus a star y k minus a star a x twiddle k. So that weak limit will satisfy the uh, uh, fixed uh, the, the, the fixed point equation, the minimizing equation for the functional. Okay, in case that, I mean you can do some more complicated argument if it's not the case, but in case that minimizer is unique, which is, for instance, the case if the kernel of A is zero. Even, even if the kernel of A is not trivial, then it's highly unlikely, because of the L1 norm term, that you will have a non-unique minimizer. Because you would need two things in the kernel that both are very sparse. But, I mean, it is possible. But in most cases, the minimizer will be unique. If the minimizer is unique, which is the case if A has trivial kernel, then uh, it follows that every uh, every convergent subsequence, every subsequence I take of this will have a weakly convergent subsequence to that limit. I mean, you can parlay that into showing that there exists, that the whole thing must converge. Because if something stayed away from it, then you would have a subsequence there that did converge and you had a problem. So we have convergence in the infinite case. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to get a little bit of water. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Okay. So we have found that the xn converge. To, uh, well, they converge weakly to uh, limit. Um, because they can't converge to anything else. Um, 
and if they do a minimizer. And in fact, you can prove that they converge strongly to the minimizer too, and the argument escapes me right now. And so let me not try to recon to So we have an iteratively uh, soft-thresholded <laughs> algorithm, which is this one. And so this is of called ISTA, iteratively soft-thresholded algorithm. Um, it turns out that you can speed up this algorithm using a trick from optimization theory uh, that was invented by Nesterov that I still have not really understood. I mean, uh, what it amounts to is that you, uh, you play, you put in uh, a parameter here, um, a u, n, and you play with the mu n, and I can understand the derivation and how he shows that it goes faster, and I have not the slightest idea of what is really going on. And I asked him, and he says, but you can see it, it works. I said, yes, but what's going on underneath? And he, I mean, either it's so obvious to him that he couldn't tell me any other way, or, or uh, so. That's an algorithm that then called FISTA, fast iteratively, iterative soft thresholding algorithm. And there are a number of, of things that people have tried to make these things even faster um, with, with varying success. Um, but as I said, the uh, Engineers like to work with something in which you circumvent the L1 norm by putting in weights. So now, so what we really want to look at is this functional. Um, but what we are going to look at instead, we're going to introduce an A, and I'm going to introduce a W, and I'm going to introduce epsilons. So, I mean, all of these are going to be sequences. Um, so, I start with ax minus y squared. Um, and then I have an x minus a squared minus ax minus a squared. And then this w has nothing to do with the w of the window functions anymore. I mean, they're just a sequence of weights, so. 
If I remember it correctly, so let's let's okay. Uh, yes. No, X is X. Sorry. And there's probably a gamma here somewhere, probably a two gamma here. Might be just a gamma, I don't know. Let's look at it. Action N is an epsilon K. It's because you had an epsilon before. I mean, the definition. Um, I mean, epsilon will change from time to time. Yes, epsilon is a sequence. So the uh, so yeah, there's no double, there's, there's an epsilon here. So there's no n in here. Okay, they will come in. Thank you. Um, and what we are going to do is we're going to optimize in turns. So xn plus 1 is going to be the argmin of gx xn with the wn's and epsilon n. And Wn is a sequence, and epsilon n is just a number for the nth k. Um, the epsilon n's will have to work with that, but I'm going to assume that the epsilon n's are non-increasing. Wn is going to be the argmin of G xn xn w and epsilon n. So that's easy to see immediately, because the equation we get for W is x n k squared plus epsilon n squared minus 1 over W k squared equals 0. So this is that. So W k, W n k is 1 over that. But it's still convenient for me to think of it as something that I vary like that. And, uh, and that's why I have no 2 here. Because you see that in the limit, each of these terms is going to contribute one of the things to x1. Okay, so let's now write my the whole chain of equalities again in Goral Kuhn. G of xn plus 1 
Um, x n if I put, take the same for the xn plus 1 xn then these extra terms I've introduced don't matter um, and if I then take w n plus 1 and epsilon n plus 1 then what I have is a x n plus 1 minus y squared. The extra terms, the extra quadratic terms don't matter. And then I have 2 gamma um, sum over k of x n plus 1 k squared plus epsilon n plus 1 squared to the power a half and since my x's are going to be bounded again if I take my epsilon n non-increasing and epsilon n going to zero then this will go so the difference between this And f of xn plus 1 will go to 0. I have that. Now let's look at, at all this minimizing stuff. So the g xn plus 1, xn plus 1, wn plus 1, epsilon n plus 1 is less so this here is less than what I get if I put in epsilon n. Uh, is that what I wanted to do? I want to get rid of... to find the right order of doing these things. Um, Except that there is an order where it works. Mm -hmm. Well, in the paper there was. Uh, <laughs> um, we'll read the paper. Okay. <laughs> so, so what you do, so what happens here is, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting really, it is a long time and I'm getting at the end of my, my uh, stamina. Um, what happens is that you have to, uh, um, you, you do a very similar argument where you concatenate things and you, the, the, the whole thing is really um, predicated on the fact that you can find an epsilon sequence that is decreasing and that goes to zero and for which all this will work. And you will, the reason, you, you cannot abs put epsilon n to a non-zero value before the limit because otherwise you will get in trouble because you really are looking at this WNs and if one of these things is zero by accident too early then epsilon n, it, epsilon n needs to be on zero. Um, so epsilon n is not allowed to go to zero too fast or your proof will start failing. On the other hand, it has to go to zero for things to work. And 
the 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 miracle that the, uh, the 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 thing that ultimately makes it work is that you uh, you you consider um, you 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 set epsilon n plus one to be the minimum. You pick some number bigger, uh, smaller than one, alpha n plus one, and then you put um, no, you put it as the maximum of alpha n plus one, and um, and you look at the previous. So you put in something, uh, uh, sorry, x. You put in something that goes to zero, that depends on the, I mean, so it's only if you already have explicitly converged that epsilon becomes zero. On the other hand, since this goes to zero and that goes to zero, epsilon has to go to zero. And that is what makes the proof ultimately work. I mean, um, so can you generalize the statement? The statement is that, uh, okay, the statement is that by defining <laughs> in the correct, uh, this, this, this xn plus one and that, uh, so, okay, a theorem. <coughs> well, I actually didn't write the statement for the previous version either. Uh, although in the paper there are theorems, proofs and so on, so it's a math paper. So, theorem. If f of x has a unique minimizer, Assuming the norm of A is smaller than 1? Um, but in fact, uh, it can be formulated even if that's not the case, because you can scale it down until it's less than one. But of course you have to do that before the algorithm. Then this minimizer
mean a minus in front of the term A? Yes, thank you. Yes, actually, it's the minimum of epsilon n minus 1 and the maximum of this. And you had to put that in also because I needed the decreasing. And uh, you have to worry about the fact that uh, our epsilon n might get stuck. But in fact, it turns out you can prove as part of the proof that it never gets stuck. I mean, it can get stuck a number of times, but that then it, because this goes to zero and alpha n goes to zero, this goes to zero, and so it can't stay stuck. And uh, alpha is some number and alpha between zero is picked arbitrarily. Yes. So why do you prefer this algorithm to the previous one? So there was the previous one that you described without the... Yes, so I... Uh, um, the reason... This is much, much easier to program, turns out. Yeah, and uh, because it's quadratic, mm -hmm. in principle I would have to do the argmin every time. But okay. in order to, pro uh, to do that, people f do conjugate gradient. And okay. conjugate gradient, they do a couple of steps and they stop. And if you, even if you do that and you don't do the full argmin, you can prove that the resulting thing still converges. That was something I must have is similar to what you described one hour ago? Or? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what I described one hour ago. I mean, this is, this is, this is uh, in, in, in mathematical words, what I described in just hand-waving things one hour ago. So what, what you, uh, you have an algorithm that's just purely quadratic, so you can do conjugate gradient, and in practice you just do conjugate gradient a couple of steps, and then you go to the next iteration, and it still converges. And that converges faster than many, many other proposed methods. And engineers just, I mean, it, typically they have very good code that is optimized for quadratic problems. And they just plug it in. And uh, and also, I mean, uh, people had been well, people were doing, uh, so this is called IRLS, iteratively reweighted least squares. So people had been doing iteratively reweighted least squares for, for a long time, and uh, usually you don't really hit problems. I mean, things don't become zero. But in this, iter in, in this, this uh, uh, depending on the problem you're looking at, if you really know that there are sparse solutions, you will hit zeros. And if you hit one zero by accident too early, then you do get in trouble in your algorithm. So, um, uh, so people had been putting in epsilons at random and so on, and it was not known that you could put in epsilon in such a way that the whole thing, the convergence wasn't hurt. And so that was... And apart from the plume, problem you mentioned, what are the applications of this, just to have an idea? Oh, um, so whenever you, um, so for many, actually many problems that people work in, where people work in wavelets, they like to work in wavelets because they believe that they need the high resolution that wavelets will give you to find scale, but you need it only in certain places. Mm -hmm. You don't know where 
But with hindsight, I mean, so wavelets were successful for image analysis in the 80s, late 80s, beginning 90s, and so on, and, and since then. With hindsight, uh, we now, I mean, I believe now, that uh, this was a first instance of sparse expansions. I mean, so what the, the paradigm has been for a long time that you want to expand into bases because it makes your life easy. And you typically expand in a basis that's given to you. And very often you have to work harder and harder the further you go in your basis. I mean, Hermes or, or, or Hermel polynomials. And so at some point you're exhausted and you stop. And that's your approximation. Um, Things like wavelet bases and other bases gave rise to situations where you could expand in many, many coefficients, but only a few of them were going to be useful. And so, but you don't know which ones ahead of time. And so that's typically what we call a nonlinear approximation. I mean, by the fact that the spaces of just a few coefficients, the, 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 the set of all such things is not a linear space anymore. So you approximate out of this nonlinear space or, uh, or, or compressed sensing sparse expansions. Um, but then with wavelets, we, we had enough understanding of the problem and the progress in harmonic analysis had given the powerful theorems that were needed in order to show that indeed this expansion was going to be useful, that you had a situation where you had kind of guessed the right building blocks for sparse expansions. We now know that there are many situations in which sparse representation is useful, but we don't know the building blocks. And that's what many people are doing presently in learning. In, in, uh, they're trying to learn the right building blocks in order to do sparse expansions. But we're still in most of the interesting problems are at the stage where we don't even have a good formulation of those building blocks. We know we have built algorithms that ultimately will do some approximation, but we don't understand those algorithms well enough. But I think that's what's going on, is that we are building very efficient approximations in, 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 uh, for, for problems, and we have to optimize for them. So there are situations for which we have learned to build sparse building blocks that are beyond wavelets and that are useful. And people have done that in, in, in things like compressed sensing and, and, and other in sparse computations. And, and, and then there are beyond that, and that's more recent uh, uh, situations in which we have these, these complicated algorithms that do very well and we have to start studying them. And I think, I mean, but that's a different matter. I think people in computer science that do deep learning should really work with physicists in trying to understand their networks. Because they don't have the right, I mean, I was talking with people last week, they don't have the right impetus of saying, I now have a complex object that does good things. What is it? What are the inner workings of that object? How could I stimulate it? I mean, they can. They can give it special stimuli and then try to see what it is in the network that is working in order to understand what the network is doing. Because their networks are way too complicated for what but they don't know how to probe it and how to analyze it. But that's yet another stage. So, so my, my, my take is these decompositions into sparse expansions are really useful when you know the building blocks. Wavelets, any problem that people use wavelets for, you really want to work with sparse expansions. So these L1 penalized problems are, uh, algorithms are really useful. And uh, uh, there are other situations where we have constructed building blocks in which, which are not wavelets, but in which we know we need to be sparse. So again, these L1 penalized algorithms will be useful. And then there are situations where we haven't even identified the building blocks, but once we have, they will be useful again. And the basis here is important for the L1 part. If I have a Hilbert space, the first yes. part is I don't need the basis. No, it's 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 the L1, L1 part. part. Yeah, it's the L1 really part, basis. the coefficients Projection, in that yeah. basis, okay. and and that makes it really basis dependent. Yes. I mean, it's so you you have to be in that basis, so you have to identify that basis first.
Just, yeah. just for the last reason, so, so compared to the FISTA algorithm, which is solving exactly the same problem, so the yeah. Nestle of has guaranteed is proving more or less that he, uh, when you are looking at the value at the, the way, the speed at which the criterion is reaching, zero is uh, like one over the square of this. Yes. That's upper bound. Yes. So do you have comparable results to show Well, it, it's. Is it, is it a, one like one over the number of because it's more or less. It's one over uh, uh, like typically, but but once you start doing this with conjugated gradient steps, I don't we don't have uh, 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 theoretical results anymore, mm -hmm. because we don't wait for convergence. We, we we just do one or two conjugate gradient steps and then go further, and then uh, also what people in practice do is uh, they they play with this exponent. Once you are in, you believe that you're close to the right thing, you increase this exponent so that you have an even lower L1 norm. So you're no longer convex, but I mean, so, but you, you hope that in, you're right in the attraction basin, and of course that speeds, speeds up things uh, tremendously. But even if you just compute in terms of, in iteration between being solving this, Yes. Is this one of you, you still have this type of results? Or? Yeah, but, but you, can't, uh, you can do the Nesterov trick to this as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, in order to get the speed up that you get. I mean, uh, and it works for the same weird reasons all the time. I mean, do, do you understand this Nesterov thing, really? I mean, uh, I, but there must be a reason. I mean, if things work, that's my, my credo. If things work, they work for a reason. And, uh, and so. It's the mathematician's challenge to find a reason. Okay, I'm sorry, I became a little less uh, uh, limpid at the end. Yes. Can I just help you with one more question? So, you like, you like the L1 norm. Uh, yes. What about the L1, I don't know, L1011 norm or something like this, which would be more convex? Does, does it, is, it, is it a bad norm for some reason? It's, it's uh, once. Uh, for engineers, anything that's not two is something they like less. Okay, and one is... Uh, yeah, and 10, 11, 11 tenths uh, is... Uh, would, would the things converge, uh, you know... No, uh, as soon as you make p bigger than one, it, it converges slowly. Actually, you, you would like to take p less than a ha one to get faster convergence. But you, since it's not convex, you may, you may not have uh, uh, the, the local minima or not global minima. And in practice, you have many local minima. I mean, so what people do is they they work with L1 unless un, until until things really start creeping down. I mean, because L1 it kind of it gets to a point where you, you you feel like like you're you're watching grass grow. I mean, when you get to that point, you say, okay, I believe there's nothing serious in the neighborhood except the true minimum, and then you 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 crank down your norm. And, uh, so if you used L three half norms, you would not be doing thresholding or. It wouldn't be thresholding, but you get you get uh, instead of, of uh, you get a funny funny kind of other uh, thing. Um, wait. <coughs> no, you. Uh, it's um, I forget. No, you, you continues then. You 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 you. Uh... And you you would get smaller coefficients where they're small, but not. Yeah, it's not as bad as as as. Uh, yeah, they wouldn't get zero. So yeah. Okay, thank you. More questions. Sir?